Welcome to Australia, Jeff. Thank you, Tattoo. Pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit why Bacardi has brought you to Australia. Well, it's Bacardi and DeKuyper together, um, and it's for the DeKuyper of the Works program, which is designed to show how to use their liqueur range in cocktails. And they brought me out because we were going to show how to use them in tiki cocktails. Yeah. So. Excellent. So you made a bunch of cocktails today. Uh, you, you made Pearl Diver and, and uh, what else did you make? We did a, a Bondi Beachcomber, a version of Don's Own Grog. And we did a, a Mandarin Mai Tai, a Mai Tai with a Mandarin Napoleon liqueur instead of Curacao. Yep. And we did a Suriname Swizzle, like an old 19th century style Swizzle with uh, Ruta Geneva. Mm. And um, the Tangaroa, that's right, a new tiki drink with using a mango liqueur. Ah, excellent. So the, can you tell us a little bit more how you use the Kuiper liquors in these drinks uh, to highlight the different qualities of the cocktail? That well, yeah, um, the, I mean, most vintage tiki recipes don't call for a whole lot of liqueurs. They're mostly like syrups. Um, for example, if Don the Beachcomber wanted a um, blackberry flavor in his drink, he'd probably make a blackberry infused sugar syrup or something like that. But he did not have the range of flavors that you have in liqueurs today. And if he had, I think he might have relied on those a little bit more. Yeah. So, like our be our Bondi Beachcomber drink used um, De Kuiper blackberry liqueur, um, and we mixed that with creme de cacao just to give it sort of like a little chocolate note added to that. Um, and we made a drink with mango liqueur as opposed to just using mango puree um, or mang or mango um, syrup, which Don might have used. And the nice thing about doing that with the in, inside the tiki construct is that you can boost the ABV that way. It's not all about syrups that, and it, you know, if you use just syrups, which are all sweet, then you have to counteract that with more sour element and with more um, heat from more of the alcoholic ingredients. But liqueurs enable you to add flavor, body, and sweetness without necessarily overwhelming the drink with sugar. Mm. So you've been in Sydney for a couple of days. Uh, yeah. what, what else have you been up to? I've been going to bars. <laughs> lots of bars. <laughs> lots and lots of bars. Um, I did do one tourist thing, which was very cool. I did the Sydney uh, Harbour Bridge climb. And when even I conquered my fear of heights and did that. Uh, yeah. uh, but mostly what we've been doing is just checking out the cocktail scene here, which is amazing. Yep. Uh, we went to the Baxter, we went to the Barbershop, uh, we went to PS40, yep. uh, went to Jacoby's, the new tiki bar mm -hmm. that just opened up this week, um, various other places, and it's all been amazing. Like, really, really good scene. Any, any, any bars that sort of particularly pop up to you here that you really, really enjoyed? All of them. I mean, they've all been great. I mean, um, I have to say, though, that um, Jacoby, since it was full tilt tiki, I really appreciated the fact that they went whole hog yep. and did it right. Um, and then I, I just really have a soft spot for the barbershop. Yeah. I mean, I just love the vibe, love the drinks. Um, the atmosphere was great. The hospitality was great. Uh, the Baxter, they took us into that uh, secret little vintage whiskey um, oh, that's right, yeah. alcove in the back, which is amazing. Uh, PS40, I just loved the experimental nature of it all. And I love the fact that they have their whole soda lab right there in the bar for people to look at, you yep. know, the conveyor belt and all that. Um, you know, all these places were just like really just, just killing it. So what's been the most favorite thing that you've done so far on your trip here, here in Australia? Just, you know, Aside from the drinking? Aside from the drinking. Okay. Um, it's just been walking around the rocks area. Yeah. Um, and because the rocks area to me feels a little bit like the French Quarter, where you have all these historically preserved buildings and you really get a sense of the maritime history yeah. of Sydney. And, and uh, maritime history is something that really interests me, you know, like ships at sea and exploration and, and, uh, and, and all that. And uh, I just got a really interesting vibe from all that. You, know, you, you might have seen uh, those uh, lanterns at the rocks yes. in, in some of the shops. There, yes. There seems to be quite a few of those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that that that's kind of spoke to me all that. Yeah. Right. Also seeing ibises, just walking into it was uh, Macquarie Square. There's like people feeding uh, ibises. That yeah. was like really cool. We we call them bin chickens here in Australia <laughs> because they go into bins and they eat, literally eat the trash and and they smell horrible. <laughs> bin chickens. <laughs> I love it. Not the most attractive bird. Okay. Yeah, I, I probably enough. wouldn't name a drink after that. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. I think, uh, so. I, think I have to. <laughs> Hopefully it tastes better than binges. <laughs> right. So right now we're in Sydney. So you'll be visiting also Melbourne and Perth and Brisbane. So what will you be doing? Will you be doing the similar sort of presentation in, 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 in the other cities as you did here today? Yes. Um, we'll be doing basically the same drinks and um and and basically the same history yep um there are always variations you know um but the same kind of concept you know of in order to understand tiki today you have to understand tiki in 1934 and in 1944 and 54 and what brought it to the present point um, I mean, my mission has always been um, tiki evangelism, like le le spreading the notion that tiki is a legitimate cocktail category that is part of the American cocktail canon that can stand on its own alongside any other category of drink. Um, and that's, it's happening. I mean, it's happening with the cocktail renaissance, but it's just a matter of just like keeping that message forward. Yeah. yeah. So what does tiki mean to you? Tiki means a lot of things to me, but it doesn't mean drinks. Um, to call these, what used to be called back in the day, in the 1930s to the 1970s, during the first golden age, these drinks were called exotic cocktails, or they were just called tropical drinks, yeah. um, or just exotics for short. They were never called tiki drinks. Tiki drinks is a label that was affixed to this category of drink in the 21st century during the cocktail renaissance by people who were just trying to find a way to categorize these drinks. And uh, tiki means a lot of things, but it doesn't mean cocktails. Um, I mean, in some parts of Polynesia, tiki was the first man. In other parts of Polynesia, tiki is the god of the artists. Yeah. Um, and in, in Hawaii, all it means is it's a, it's a carving that your ancestor spirit is supposed to inhabit. Um, but so to call these drinks, to call tropical drinks tiki drinks, it kind of gets my back up, but I'm just rolling with it because you just can't fight the tide after a while. It's, right, it, yeah. it, it's in the same way that in the 90s, anything that was served in stemware was called a martini. Mm. You know, um, it's just say, like, all right, fine, I'll just go. You know, just, just roll with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had these different eras of tiki now. Do you think tiki will continue to evolve? Yes, it's definitely evolving. I mean, it's evolving from being almost exclusively a rum-based kind of cocktail to using different base spirits. I mean, in my travels, I've seen bars using mezcal, using uh, scotch whiskey, using uh, tequila or gin to make tiki drinks, which was not something that was done back in the first golden age, but it's something that's done routinely now, which I think is great. Everything has to evolve. Um, and and that's really where things are going. It's like using different kinds of base spirits, also using spices and flavors and ingredients that really weren't available to people during the first golden age. I mean, now um, the world's a lot smaller and things are like shipped all over the place by air, and you can get exotic spices and exotic fruits and exotic um, herbs and even garnish ingredients that were just previously just not even part of the equation in certain parts of the world. So yeah, so it's definitely evolving. And I think it's evolving towards um, Southeast Asian flavors. Um, if you look at Malaysian or uh, Indonesian or Thai cooking, and you see what's being used in, the, in those dishes, that's finding its way into a lot of drinks now. Um, and it's fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's like finding curry in a drink, for example. You know, I've That's seen that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So we're really quite spoiled for choice these days. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, much, much bigger palette to play with. Yeah. yeah. Where do you draw the line between tiki 
and non-ticky items? That's a good. That's a good question, and it's a rather loaded question. Um, to me, a proper tiki bar is a Polynesian theme bar, mm. um, and you see a lot of places that throw in African masks or stuff from Indonesia or Bali. A lot of Bali stuff. A yeah. lot of Balinese stuff. Um, anything that is the other, anything that isn't like from Western culture, and it it bothers me. Um, as a as a purist, I mean, I, I, if you're going to a Polynesian themed bar, you need Polynesian, you need oceanic art. Basically, that's right. Not not not, for example, Mayan or Aztec. Yes, yes. No no Mexi no Mexitiki yes. stuff. Yeah, Mexitiki. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that's another big problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but again, it comes down to this question of what's your definition of of tiki or a tiki bar? I mean, to me, it's a Polynesian themed bar. Mm. And it means Polynesian items, you know. Other people have a much looser definition. That's fine, but I'll, I'll take a I'll I'll take one that's based in Oceania myself. So, what do you think about tiki marks like the Tom Selleck marks and the Star Wars tiki marks? <laughs> well, um, that's a great question too. Are they tiki marks? No, they're Star Wars theme mugs, and they're and they're um, you know they're uh, Tom Selleck theme mugs. No, they're not Tiggy mugs. So just, they're just play mugs. The they're just mugs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have no problem with them as long as you don't call them Tiggy mugs. Um, what the hell is a Star Wars Tiki mug? If you've got a mug in the shape of Yoda, what is what is Polynesian about that? You know, it's a, I mean, even in the loosest definition of the term, it doesn't make any sense to to me personally. Yeah. Um, I don't begrudge people who like them. That's cool, uh, but call it what it is. Call it a Star Wars mug. <laughs> so, so where do you think this trend comes from that people are now calling all kinds of clay mugs Tiki mugs as long as it's made of clay? And it's, it's a popular served in it. Yeah, it's just an example of cultural dilution. Um, and in, in this case, the irony is, I mean, the joke is we're talking about faux Polynesian culture to begin with. Mm. You know, there are no tiki mugs in actual Polynesia. It's something that mid-century American restaurateurs came up with. It's their pop culture interpretation of Polynesian culture. And so to begin with, they're sort of delegitimate, you know, um, as much as I love them. But then when you dilute that even further, and any mug that holds a, any tall mug that holds a drink is called a tiki mug, even if it's in the shape of Darth Vader, um, I don't know. I mean, it's not the most um, pressing problem we have in in uh, in the world today, but it's it still just strikes me as ridiculous. So, Jeff, you have a restaurant in the bar Latitude Twenty Nine. Um, what was the inspiration behind that, behind opening that bar? It was just time to stop writing about drinks and start serving them. I mean, I basically had nothing else to say as a writer. I'd, I'd done everything that I wanted to do, and all of these books had launched all of these bars. I would look at the menus from some of the new tiki bars that happened after my books, and sometimes up to 80% of the menu would be recipes that I discovered or decoded or, um, or or just sort of rescued from the dustbins of history. And I thought, well, maybe I should try to make some money off of those too. <laughs> Fair <laughs> so, enough. Yeah, so we, and, and I saw, we saw a lot of places doing it right, which was great, but there were also a lot of places not doing it right. And I wanted to have a place that did it right. Mm. Um, and that paid proper respect and homage to the past, while also with an eye toward the future of tiki mythology yeah. as well. And, and no Mexitiki. No Mexitiki. <laughs> no. <laughs> so let's let's talk about cocktails. Um, what defines a good tiki cocktail? A tiki cocktail is basically a Caribbean cocktail, uh, squared or cubed, um, whereas rum, lime, and sugar are the holy trinity of Caribbean drinks. 
Um, there's rum, lime, and sugar in a planter's punch. There's rum, lime, and sugar in a tea punch in Martinique. Uh, there's rum, lime, and sugar in a daiquiri in Cuba. Uh, and basically, that's, that is the template. What tiki drinks did, or what Don the Beachcomber, who is the creator of the tiki drink, did, was they, he complicated it. Yeah. Instead of just lime, what if we did more than one citrus? What if we blended lime and grapefruit together? Lime and grapefruit and passion fruit. Mm. Um, and the same thing with the sugar element. Why just sugar? Why not do uh, a, a sugar, a cinnamon infused sugar syrup or a vanilla infused sugar syrup? Uh, what about if we use honey? What about if we use honey blended with grenadine or blended with um, more sweeteners to create more layers of flavor? Uh, just complications. And the same thing with the base spirit. Why just one rum? What happens if we take um, the, the dry white Cuban rum you would use in a daiquiri and mix it with the heavy high ester um, molassesy Jamaican rum that you would put in a planter's punch. Mm. What happens when those two rums are together? They inform each other, they change each other, they create something better than the two of them individually. Then throw a third rum in there, maybe like a smoky charred wood uh, tasting rum from Guyana. That, uh, that adds even more layers of flavor to the base. So that's the ethos of Tiki, is just taking that very simple Caribbean construct and dimensionalizing it. So, so when you go to a Tiki bar that you haven't been to before, what are the first cocktails that you'll try there? The first thing I'll generally try is something that comes from one of my books. Mm. For example, if there's a pearl diver on there, or if there's a zombie, or if there's a cobra's fang, or a puka punch, I want to see what they did with it. Yeah. Um, either they're paying homage to the traditional version and doing it right, or they're twisting it, twisting it up and doing their own new 21st century take. Either way, that's a good baseline for me mm. to judge how they're doing. So. Yeah. yeah, so that'll give you an idea then. then right, sort of, yeah. and that, that tells me whether I want to venture further into their menu and try one, an original drink they've done, mm. you know. Uh, and what is the most important element in a tiki bar? For me, personally, it's the atmosphere. It's the decor. Mm. Because if I've got a beautiful room, a beautiful transportive atmosphere, um, and the drinks are crap. Mm. I can always order a straight rum, you know, um, or I can order a beer, um, and I'll still be happy mm. sitting in the room. Uh, but you can have the best drinks in the world served in a place that feels like a dentist's office, and, mm. and I don't want to be there. There's, there's no escape, escapism in the <laughs> dentist's office. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> not, until, not until the Novocaine That's kicks right. in. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Do you see a uh, resurgence of any specific tiki drinks that have sort of been forgotten in, in history but are making a comeback? Yes, I do. Um, specifically, drinks that use Don's honey butter mix. I've seen a lot of pearl divers lately, pearl yeah. diver variations. Um, I think people are coming on to that. Um, the one drink that's really taken off um, is the Jungle Bird. Um, and I think that's a good gateway tiki drink for non-tiki craft cocktail bartenders simply because it has an Amaro in it. Um, you know, having Campari in it is a, is a way in for them, yeah. you know? Um, so, that, so that's like, the, you see that on a lot of menus is a Jungle Bird. So it, it makes it a little bit easier for them to just sort of gradually get into it. Exactly, the, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. In your books you've uh, revived many long lost tiki recipes, uh, what was the most challenging recipe to find or recreate? There's one recipe in particular that was a huge pain in the ass. Um, it was called the Nui Nui. It took me about three years to figure it out. When I finally got the recipe after many, many, many years of wanting to know what was in this drink, um, it was in code. Uh, because Don the Beachcomber put all of his recipes in code to stop people from stealing them. So the recipe read um, half, half lime, half orange, one quarter number two, one quarter number four, dash number eight, 
and then it mentioned St. Croix rum. It's like, what the hell was I supposed to do with that? Uh, it just seemed impenetrably. Yeah. But over the years, I was lucky enough to be living in Los Angeles at a time when a lot of retired old Tiki bartenders could still be tracked down and questioned. And the first thing I learned was that number four was a cinnamon syrup. Um, and then gradually I was able to decode number two after talking to different people um, who gave me different leads. And number eight just turned out to be do Angster Bitters, yeah. uh, which I only found out because I found another um, encoded book that actually had a key, like a code key. Um, so that drink took forever to figure out how to make. Um, and so, of course, that was the first thing I put on the menu at Latitude, you know, just like, uh, so I was so happy about it. So, so all the more satisfying after all that work. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Are there any recipes that still are with you? That Don the Beachcombers restaurants in Hawaii, I have some of the menus from the 1950s and 60s, and there are drinks on there that I have no idea what they are. One's called the Cannibal Grog. Mm. I want to know what's in so, a cannibal grog. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, who wouldn't want to know what's in yeah, a cannibal yeah, grog? Right. Um, there are other ones like the, um, oh, let's see, off the top of my head, I can't remember names, but there are three or four drinks from his menus that I just don't know what's in them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so tell us more about your Tiki app. Yes, that was in, done in collaboration with uh, Martin Duderoff, um, who is sort of like a, a complete tech wizard. Um, all I did was give him the recipes that I had and some graphics, and then that's all. Then he did everything else, mm. um, and it's been very, very well received. People really like the app. It's very user friendly. Um, it's very good interactive kind of thing. We keep adding new recipes as I find new as I find new old recipes. Mm. We add them in if I encounter an amazing new recipe by someone who's working today. We'll put it in. Um, so it's always a work in progress, it's always evolving and being updated. But Martin really was the driving creative force behind it and, um, and, and people really do respond well. Martin's since gone on to do just about every major cocktail app there is. He's done apps for David Wondrich, uh, Gary Reagan, and Jim Meehan, and okay. just on and on and on. Wow. So. But I was the first. Oh, there I you was go. the first. Yeah. So any, any chance that we'll, we'll see an Android version before? I, it's, it's A lot of people ask me about an Android version. I get emails every week. Um, it's something that uh, Martin and I are talking about. He's just trying to figure out how to make that financially work. Um, just, to, just to get the capital together to do that. But it is it, it's something we're definitely um, thinking about. Fair enough. Yeah. And are you currently writing any new books that we should know about? I've got one more book in me, and it's an old book, but with a new um, makeover. It's the 10th anniversary edition of Sip and Safari. Yep. Um, I, ho I hope it's going to be printed by October. Um, but Sip and Safari came out in 2007, which was about two years before the whole Tiki Cocktail Renaissance started to happen. I didn't see it coming back then. I didn't think it was going to happen. And in the 10 years since Sippin', it's, as you know, there's been this global explosion of, of yeah. a Tiki Drink Revival. So uh, the 10-year anniversary edition encompasses that. There's like a 40-page um, afterward, which talks about what happened after the book was published. And I interview a lot of bartenders about how the book influence them to do their things that they do like Paul McGee and, and Martin Cade and Daniela Dallapola in Italy and um, and you know uh, Georgie from the Mahiki and, and people like that and I've got recipes by them that were inspired by Sippin. Um, there's also like a, a long uh, preface talking about what led up to Sippin Safari back in the early days of Tiki Revival and I also, as a bonus, I'm including like 14 vintage recipes that I didn't have in the original edition. Either because I could, hadn't cracked the code yet, or I just didn't know how to make them. Uh, but in the 10 years since, new information has come to light. So you know, hopefully so. in this new book we'll see the cannibal grog recipe as well. Uh, well, that one's not in there, but uh, but yeah, we'll have to do a new 15-year uh, edition. <laughs> Are you planning on doing any more rum collaborations or any other kind of collaborations similar to what you did with Plantation or FTD? Well, um, if Alexander asks, I will be the first person to say yes. I really enjoyed the collaboration with him. 
Um, nobody's asked me, yeah. um, but if they ask me, I'm, of course I'm totally into it. You know, it's just like that. I can't imagine anything cooler than collaborating on a new rum. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The, not many things I can. I can't really think anything cooler than that either. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. What, what's better than that? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so. White rums. What would be the wet, best tiki drink to make with white rum? Well, of course the. It's not a tiki drink, but a daiquiri would be, you know, the, the, a nice way to do it. But um, white rum was used in an interesting way back in the day. It was used kind of the way vodka is used now. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a very neutral taste. It's not going to be something that overwhelms other ingredients in a drink. Um, but if you look at a drink like the Missionary's Downfall, which has so much going on in it, fresh mint, fresh diced pineapple, honey, peach brandy, lime, um, if you put a very distinctive, heavy-bodied, flavorful rum in it, you just overwhelm all of the other flavors at work. But a, a, a white rum with a sort of a more neutral flavor profile just gives you the necessary ABV um, to make it a cocktail, and it doesn't fight. So you it doesn't fight all the other so ingredients. You wouldn't necessarily have a heavy pasta white rum. Right, it would destroy that drink. Mm. So if you've got a drink with a lot going on in it, um, a lot of uh, culinary um, fruits, herbs, spices, etc., um, sometimes a white rum is the way to go because it's, it's going to just you know boost the ABV, turn it into a legitimate drink as opposed to a non-alcoholic thing. But it's also um, not going to fight all the other stuff that's going on. So, I mean, the first thing I would do is just go look at drinks like the Missionary's Downfall yeah. you know, and take it from there. Right. Yeah. Tahitian Punch. Oh. Tahitian Punch is just basically lime, passion fruit, and white rum. I mean, lime and, the lime and passion are very nice, and there's really no need to, over, to um, you know, it's kind of overkill to put yeah. a heavy rum in there. That's right. Yeah. So just keep it nice and light. Yeah. Where can we see you next? I'm going to the UK Rum Fest in October, um, held by my buddy Ian Burrell. Oh, that's right. My and buddy too. Yes, <laughs> our, our good friend, the, the Rum Ambassador. That's always a fun event, and that'll be, that'll be the, the next place I'm going. And then right after that, I'm going down to Barcelona um, and uh, doing a little uh, tiki session there. Um, and after that, um, possibly St. Lucia to check out Chairman's Reserve and the distillery there. Yeah, and uh, Taipei. I'm going to be going checking out the cocktail scene in Taipei in Taiwan. Um, and I'm going to be doing some rum judging. Um, for the for the ADI um, American Distilling Institute in uh, Northern California, I think in February, we're going to be judging on a panel there, so that'll be fun. Um, yeah. that sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for answering our questions and coming coming all the way to Australia for us. Anytime, tattoo. You, I, I'm really enjoying myself. I'm really happy to be here. That's fantastic. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll see you at the UK Rump. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jeff, we've got one more thing for you. We've brought a little Australian present here for you. So we've got some tea and of course some Tim Tams. Ah, oh, yes, Tim Tams. Tim Tams. Fantastic. And a nice cup to drink the tea out of. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Birds of Australia, I love it. Fantastic. Love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Cheers. Mahalo. Thanks again for coming. All right, my pleasure. Thank you guys. All right. All right.